Welcome to the lecture on bioenergy and biomaterials from a life cycle perspective. Biofuels and biomaterials are presented often as the example of a sustainability solution because they are renewable, they are low carbon, they contribute to local value creation and they can substitute fossil energy carriers or conventional materials such as steel or cement. On the downside, their production consumes or uses a lot of land and increasing demand for biofuels and biomaterials drives land use change, for example the conversion of pristine forest into plantations. And in this lecture I will show you how we can use a systems approach and life cycle thinking in particular to quantify the different impacts of biofuels and biomaterials and to understand under which conditions they can actually make a positive contribution to sustainable development. The lecture has different parts. We will first understand what the life cycle perspective on biofuels and biomaterials is. Then I will report some of the main findings of life cycle assessment on biofuels and biomaterials and also report the main applications of LCA on this issue and give a short outlook on the link between bioenergy, biomaterials, the so-called bioeconomy and sustainability in general. Humans need different services, for example, transportation, communication or shelter, nutrition. And the provision of these services requires energy and materials. And often we have different options of how we can supply ourselves with energy carriers and materials. Here you see an example of four transportation fuels, fossil diesel, soy-based diesel, palm oil diesel, with and without land use change in the supply chain. And these products are more or less identical, meaning that you can easily substitute them, just, you know, go to the gas station and get any of these fuels and put it into your car. But the supply chain of these products is vastly different and also the environmental impacts associated with their supply and other consequences. The question is, how can we take these different production impacts into account if the products are more or less substitutable? And the answer is, we do that by applying a life cycle perspective to the product or the service. That means we quantify and study the entire supply chain of how the product was made and also what will happen to the product once it is disposed of. In this picture here you see the example of a biofuel supply chain from farming, processing, fuel transportation stages to then its eventual use as a transportation fuel. And at each step of this supply chain we quantify the material and energy flows required and also the different resource uses and environmental impact. And we apply the life cycle perspective to address the following three main points listed here. First, we want to compare different supply chains. We want to compare one product to another regarding its total greenhouse gas emissions in the supply chains, total material use or maybe total environmental impact regarding land use. Second, we want to identify supply chain hotspots in the supply chain of individual products. These are processes that contribute a lot to a certain impact category, for example to global warming or to an emission of a certain toxic chemical. Third, we want to quantify burden shifting across sectors. For example, when we shift from gasoline vehicles to battery electric vehicles, the greenhouse gas emission will shift from tailpipe emission, burning gasoline, to emissions from electricity supply. This burden shift needs to be taken into account when getting a full picture of the environmental impacts of a certain service provision chain. So summarizing this first part here, in the life cycle perspective, we don't see a product or a service just as an isolated thing that we can consume, but we see it as being connected to its supply chain. And in this supply chain, we have hotspots that we need to identify to manage them or to communicate them. We need to compare different supply chains to then quantify how we shift environmental burden from using one supply chain to environmental burdens in another supply chain. 
So this is the practical implementation of systems thinking when evaluating different products and services and biofuels and biomaterials in particular. So what specific questions do we ask in the life cycle perspective? One of the questions is we want to know how the raw materials for our product or service were sourced. Do they come from sustainable forestry or agriculture? Do they involve child labor and so on? Another question is, did land transformation occur? Was forest cleared to produce the biofuel that we are now consuming? This is an important question for the life cycle perspective. What energy source was used? Is the aluminum that I'm buying here produced with coal-based electricity or with hydropower electricity? What byproducts occurred in the production? Maybe there was some valuable forest or agricultural byproducts that uh, allow for other value creation. That's also important to know. How much transport was needed? There's a difference whether I get the tomatoes or the apples from Spain or I can source them from regional sources. So this also needs to be quantified. And finally, what impacts are expected during the disposal stage when I burn, landfill or recycle the product that I have at hand. The purpose of the life cycle perspective is to associate environmental impacts far away with consumption here in front of me. But this association does not yet mean a responsibility. Just because I have a certain carbon footprint in my supply chain doesn't yet mean that I'm fully or even partly responsible for it. Responsibility is only assigned once you use a certain moral perspective or you apply a certain legal framework. This is not the core part of industrial ecology. Industrial ecology deals with the upper part here to quantify the association of impacts with consumption and the assignment of responsibility for impacts is dealt with by other disciplines or other perspectives. So this lecture mostly focus on the first part, how we can associate environmental impacts. And then I will give a quick outlook only on responsibility when we, for example, talk about the low carbon fuel standard. So let's continue with the technical side of the life cycle perspective. The core element of applying life cycle thinking to a product or service is the quantification of the so-called product system. The product system is a model of a part of the economy whose only purpose is to supply a certain service, the service I want to study. For example, the biofuel or the biomaterial that I'm interested in. This product system is a small supply chain from farming to processing transport and it has environmental impacts because it needs raw materials and also it has emissions to the environment. And there may be other products from that product system like byproducts or waste that can be used elsewhere. So the product system is a small section of the economy whose only purpose is to deliver the product or service that I'm interested in. And the goal is to quantify this product system. LCA is an engineering based approach. So what we do when quantifying product system is we would start with an engineering model shown here on the left side. So you have the relevant process steps. Here this is for a biofuel, but we do not quantify the engineering process itself only, but we expand the system boundary. We are interested in the input of natural resources. We are also interested in the emissions to the environment. And we're also interested in the impacts of providing all the ancillary products, the energy needed, the water needed, and also what happens with the waste that is generated. So you see that the system definition for the life cycle assessment for the product system is more comprehensive than the engineering system definition. And the challenge in life cycle assessment is to quantify all these different flows of energy materials in the system on the right side here. The practical challenges of doing that are dealt with in other parts of this course, lectures and exercises. Here I want to show you a typical result. As I said, one of the main applications of life cycle thinking is the comparison. And here you see an example of that. We have two types of biodiesel, the palm oil based biodiesel and the soybean bean biodiesel. And also we have 
on the right side here the fossil reference which has a higher carbon footprint than all of these alternatives so it doesn't fit into the graph here and for each of these diesel types we have different studies looking at specific supply chains for example in different countries or different subspecies and you see here the contribution of the different process stages the agricultural stage transport the transesterification stage to the overall greenhouse gas impact of these biodiesels and you see that there's a wide variation in impacts and also these particular biofuels all perform better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than the fossil diesel which is here far on the right side now from this study alone we could conclude that low carbon fuels are possible by using these two feedstocks the full picture is more complicated and not that optimistic however because we know that a lot of the biofuels produced is farmed on recently converted forest land and it's now widely agreed upon that we have to factor in these land use change emission from clear cutting the forest and from the soil carbon decomposition into the life cycle greenhouse gas balance of the biofuels an example of such a calculation is shown here where we see a comparison of the biodiesel carbon footprint calculated by taking the life cycle perspective for different feedstocks rapeseed palm oil used cooking oil and fossil diesel and you see among others that the palm oil greenhouse gas balance is dominated by the land use change emissions so these are the emissions from the original forest clear cutting that are then distributed across the entire production lifetime of the palm oil plantation another way of visualizing the consequences of land use change emission is to plot the cumulative emission of the fuel production system over time here you see two systems compared the straight black line is fossil diesel production for example by an oil refinery over the years so there's a certain output every year so the fossil diesel emissions add up same amount every year the second alternative is the biofuel production and this curve is flatter because without the land use change the palm oil diesel is a low carbon fuel as we saw on the last slide so we have for the same amount of diesel produced a lower increment every year in co2 emissions than with the fossil alternative but the the biodiesel line starts with an offset and this offset equals to the land use change emission this is a typical situation in life cycle thinking and comparison we have two product systems that have a different emission in their use or operation phase but one of the system requires a higher upfront emissions or investment and this situation also applies to the land use case here land use change case and the consequence of that comparison is that if you have a short time horizon for example if the plantation only lasts for let's say 20 years you will be in a range where the accumulated emissions from the biodiesel chain are larger than the accumulated emissions from the fossil chain only if you wait long enough this initial emissions investment so to say will have paid off and in between there is a break-even point which defines as you see here the so-called payback time the time for which you have to wait until the initial em emissions investments here from land use change pays off so this again the payback time is a crucial concept in life cycle thinking the land use change issue however is more complicated than just factoring in the direct land use change from converting primary forests for example to make place for palm oil plantations we also have the issue of so-called indirect land use change this is a market mediated effect when we increase the demand for bioenergy and biomaterials there will be a market response to it and ideally that means that marginal land land that was previously not productive 
or unproductive will be taken into use. But in practice, we see very often that we have also very productive land like forests, tropical forests that are then converted to fuel or fulfill the growing global demand for biofuels and biomaterials. So life cycle thinking now increasingly also factors in the market effects induced by increasing demand for biofuels and biomaterials and the response of the different um, nations and different ecosystems to it. For example, by factoring in how much additional forest will be cleared on average if demand for a certain biofuel increases. Another issue that's related especially to biomaterials is the question how we factor in carbon storage in biomaterials. Imagine the following situation. You take a tree out of the forest and you put it into a building, for example as a piece of furniture or maybe a window frame or a beam in the roof of the building. The carbon in the wood there will be stored for several decades, maybe even centuries, while at the same time the forest already regrows and sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. So in the ideal case, such a timber harvesting and use system can even be carbon negative. And we want to quantify these impacts using, again, the systems approach, and in particular using a system definition that is shown here, including the forestry process and the harvesting, including the storage, and then eventually a decomposition of the wood, for example, in burning or energy recovery. And the findings are quite interesting. We see here that there are two examples for different carbon flows in our system that we can compare. We have a red and a blue scenario. Red scenario means we store the material for 50 years and burn it later. So this is why on the left side you have here an emission pulls after 50 years. The blue scenario is the energy scenario. We harvest the wood and burn it right away. Blue scenario means emissions peak in year zero. Then we have the gray bars and these are negative because this is the carbon sequestered annually by the regrowing forest. The question is now how do we convert these carbon flows into a global warming metric? And the answer is shown on the right side. We convert the carbon flows that we cause with our life cycle into carbon stocks in the atmosphere using a carbon cycle model and a mathematical operation. And here we see that the energy pulse, the blue one, slowly will decline. So the carbon will be sequestered and eventually be negative because the regrowing forest causes for net negative emissions in the atmosphere. The carbon will be in the oceans and in the biosphere, so there is actually a net sequestration. Interestingly, for the material part, the net sequestration is larger because we store the carbon in the technosphere for some time. So this system starts getting net carbon negative over the first 50 years because we have a net sequestration. The carbon we harvested is in the building and at the same time the forest already regrows. Then we have the emissions pulls and a subsequent decline. And what we can do is we can sum up the, in, uh, the these different contributions from the integral, which is the cumulative global warming and relate this to a similar pulse of CO2 emissions, which is the reference greenhouse gas. And we see that the energy case here has roughly a 30% contribution compared to fossil CO2, whereas the material case has minus 7%. The main message here is that when we do this time resolution perspective, apply it in our life cycle thinking, we find that systems that are carbon neutral over their life cycle are not necessarily climate neutral, which you here see for the energy case. And we see that material use can actually lead to systems that are carbon neutral or maybe even carbon negative. For example, when you have a very long storage period as timber and a relatively short regrowth period, you can get carbon negative system. There's also an exercise on this really important issue in this online course. So let's go to the summary part. <clears throat> 
Here we see an example of an IPCC report comparing the different bioenergy emissions with their fossil incumbents. And you see that A, bioenergy has a wide range of emissions. And this is due to the different land use change issue I explained and due to the different processing pathways, which vary a lot in their energy demand and of course also transport distance. But overall, you see that bioenergy tends to be less carbon impactful than the fossil energy alternatives. We can also apply the life cycle perspective when looking into the future of bioenergy and biomaterials. Here an example of a so-called prospective life cycle assessment where a particular option of using bioenergy was highlighted. This particular option is called bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage, BECCS. It means that we harvest biomass from agriculture or forest. We burn it partially, but we sequester the CO2 arising from this combustion and store it geologically underground. We This thus have a carbon negative system and we can see that the life cycle impact of that system can be much lower than using bioenergy in the conventional fashion. The question of whether or not this technology is viable at a large scale depends on other issues which are not shown here in particular the amount of land needed for deploying bioenergy and in particular BECCS at the large scale. So the future contribution of bioenergy to a sustainable energy mix or to low carbon emissions is widely debated, not because bioenergy per se is not carbon friendly, it often is, but because of the huge other environmental impacts, the trade off, the land use, the transport distances required, the biodiversity impacts, and so on. So this is really a hot topic, both on the scientific side and also on the policy implementation side. Here, an overview of the main findings regarding bioenergy and materials from the LCA perspective. First, a systematic overview of how we can categorize different bioenergy and material carriers. And then we see that there is often a climate, positive climate impact from using bioenergy carriers. The picture for the different impact categories other than climate is mixed. There can often be higher impact, for example, for toxicity and eutrophication. That means impact on nutrients and water bodies. Temporary carbon storage by material use can actually lower climate impacts significantly. We have the problem that just because a material was made from organic or biomaterials, it's not necessarily biodegradable. These are also two different things. And the land use change from using bioenergy materials at a large scale is a major issue to be considered. And we now also understand why we need the life cycle perspective, because we need to exactly study which biofuel is actually a low carbon fuel from its supply chain and which is not. We need to also factor in storage effects because we demonstrated that they can really give a more realistic picture on the actual carbon impact of a material that's used, especially when it's used over a longer time frame. So what are the applications of the life cycle perspective? I want to highlight three of them. The low carbon fuel standard the use in building labels and the use in so-called environmental product declaration. Life cycle thinking finds that not all biofuels are created equal. We have huge impacts mostly resulting from land use and they can make that certain biofuels are definitely not a low carbon alternative. And this life cycle insight has been translated into policy in countries like the EU but also states like California we have so-called low carbon fuel standards where the suppliers of biofuels must demonstrate by conducting a simple life cycle assessment that their fuel actually is low carbon and has a certain emissions reduction compared 
to a diesel or gasoline alternative. Here, a bit more text, which you can read, describing the thresholds and the requirements for low carbon fuels in the EU. So this is one of the major policy applications of life cycle thinking so far. Another main application is the consideration of biomaterials and bioenergy in the life cycle assessment of buildings. With buildings, we have the challenge that both the use phase and the production stage, the material production, contribute a lot to a building's overall carbon and other environmental footprint. And the use of biomaterials and bioenergy can actually directly impact many of these stages, as shown here. The raw material sourcing stage and of course also the energy consumption and maybe there can be benefits in the end of life when we use the material in other buildings for example the so-called cascading so how can bio energy and biomaterials contribute to reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of buildings in conventional buildings top here we know that the use phase dominates energy use and the greenhouse gas balance. That means the first part shown on the left side here, the first main strategy is to use low carbon energy, of course using bioenergy. The second part is not focus on energy supply but on energy use and insulate houses well to build so-called passive houses. And once we have passive houses, we know that now the greenhouse gases from construction materials dominate the overall greenhouse gas performance of the buildings because they use so little energy during their use phase. And then we have a strong business case for using low carbon materials, including biomaterials. But we know now that just because an energy carrier is bio and a material is sourced from biogenic resources, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are low carbon. That means for both chains, for efficiency in buildings. The energy supply chain and the energy efficiency and material supply chain, we eventually will need life cycle thinking to actually identify which energy carriers are low carbon and which materials are low carbon and thus contribute to reducing the energy demand and life cycle energy demand and also greenhouse gas balance of the buildings. And that means that the different building labels we have to certify that a certain building is climate friendly increasingly make use of life cycle indicators and life cycle thinking to understand and to quantify the actual environmental impacts and greenhouse gas footprints of the energy used and of the materials used for those buildings. So this is another main application of life cycle thinking to correctly quantify the greenhouse gas impact when certifying certain buildings, individual buildings, as green, sustainable, or in another sustainability dimension. Finally, the so-called environmental product declaration, which is a simplified life cycle assessment to give business and final customers of products a rough overview of the environmental impacts of the product. So again, we move away from only assessing the product as it is, its performance and its price, but also taking into account the supply chain of the product in decision making whether or not to buy it. And a good example is shown here for a forest product. So this is an environmental product declaration and its main result page for a biomaterial here, a particle board. So you see what product it is, what properties it has, and also further below what its global warming potential and other environmental impacts are. So we're using life cycle thinking, life cycle assessment to quantify the supply chain of products, not only in scientific terms, but also in consulting terms to actually give customers the opportunity to assess their products more comprehensively before making a purchase decision. And environmental product declarations, which are simplified LCAs, are one of the main vehicles to do that. So now that we have seen the many things that can be studied 
with applying the life cycle perspective to bioenergy and biomaterials, the big question remains. What does the life cycle perspective tell us about sustainability? And from my perspective, there are two answers to that question. The first answer is it tells us a lot because the life cycle perspective links remote impacts to local consumption decisions. And this is exactly what sustainability is about. Sustainability is about making decisions that benefit yourself by taking into account the needs of others, both spatially, like the society and different countries at the same time, but also into the future, the need of the future generations. And the supply chains and the life cycles we have extend over the planet and into the future. So by taking this life cycle perspective, you automatically factor in the impacts on remote people spatially and time-wise. So that is the good thing. The second answer to that question is life cycle assessment doesn't help us so much to truly understand sustainability. And the reason is that life cycle assessment focuses on individual products or services, typically. And one liter of biofuel doesn't make the world more or less sustainable. Sustainability actually is a scale issue, right? The overall consumption levels matter. The overall impact levels, like greenhouse gas emissions, matter. And that means there is a gap between life cycle thinking and an actual comprehensive assessment of sustainability and sustainable development. We need other tools to close that gap. For example, material cycle modeling or system modeling. And one small step to make that gap between the life cycle perspective and sustainability a bit smaller is to consider upscaling when doing a life cycle assessment. So for example, you communicate your results of life cycle assessment of a certain biomaterial and you also do a study on how much can this solution be upscaled how many resources do we have so that you can not only say our fuel or material is so and so much low carbon and other positive impacts but also the overall potential for that fuel is so and so large so that nobody comes and think that this is a solution that can be scaled up indefinitely so again, please consider that life cycle assessment or life cycle thinking is a large step towards linking purchase decisions and product with sustainability, but it only goes part of the way. It's helpful in understanding the spatial and temporal uh, links in the system between your product and environmental impacts, but it is usually a small scale tool. For the large scale sustainability questions, we need additional quantifications, additional scientific study to really understand to what extent individual products and life cycles can be scaled up. With that, I want to thank you for your attention.